Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist D.T., here from Central Virginia with weatherisk.com, talking about This Week in Weather for October 16th. And as always, I am your colonel of catastrophe, your commander of chaos, and the colonel of confusion. So let's get right to it and uh, talk about our different topics here. So... First, we're going to be talking about in this issue new data about the weak La Nina. It does not look particularly strong. It looks like it's going to fall apart even faster than it was only a few weeks ago. A late season hurricane threat for the Caribbean, the huge snow cover buildup in Siberia, the persistent amount of high latitude blocking in the negative NAO we're seeing showing up already uh, day after day, week after week in northeast Canada, Greenland, Baffin Islands, Hudson's Bay and then a possible major East Coast low on October 31. So let's get right to it. This here is the website if you haven't seen it before. There you go. And you can see all sorts of great stuff here on the website. And <clears throat> of course, as always, I just want to point out here, there is the shop page where it's all our, our snow removal forecast is coming up, the grain weather products, the audio, and so on and so forth. So uh, of course, you can always get the Mid-Atlantic operational forecast here for only $35 a month. And uh, this is from March of last year, but you can see we divide up Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, North Carolina into uh, 12 different zones. And you get temperatures and precipitation and winds and forecasts and a week two and some maps. So all for $35 a month. And it's a really, really useful product. This here is the Weather Risk Grains Twitter page. When you can see here very nicely, we do our grain weather here mostly. And this here is the Blue Sky page where we do the operational weather. Okay, so... Let's get right to it and take a look what's going on here. Now, this is, I believe, let me move the mark over here, copy it, I'm sorry, we have it. This is the latest sea surface temperature anomaly map as of October 15th. And the one I want to point out here is the amazingly warm water in the northern Pacific, and there's the La Nina right here. Now, you can see the Atlantic is still kind of mild, but not that much so, but there's the definite La Nina here and the super warm northern Pacific. This is very much like we saw last October and November. There's a lot of similarities in the atmospheric patterns. Um, what's going on here in the sea surface temperatures to last year and some other similarities as well having to do with the QBO and some other factors. But we'll talk about that at some future date when you get around talking about the actual winter itself. Now, these are some latest data here from three different sources. So uh, this here is the OISST sea surface temperature map. And this is from Alex Borham, or Cyclonic Weather. And again, since October, August, you can see it's been oscillating back and forth, slowly dropping. We got down to around minus 0 0.7 at one point in early October, then jumped back up again. Now it's back down again. So the kind of kind of wild swings here. Now, this is the coral reef sea surface temperature anomaly trend. And here, the swings aren't quite as wild. but And you can see the general downward trend at around um, minus 0 0.5. At times, it's been a little colder than that, but that's generally where it's been. And that's right at the minimum threshold for La Nina. Now, this is the CDAS, which is another data set. And you've got this some tropical tidbits. And you can see that since July, it's been going down steadily. And it's just above uh, around 0 0.8, maybe minus 0 0.9 degrees centigrade, not quite 1 degree centigrade. Now, I don't like using the CDAS. I don't think it's a very accurate data set, but it's a useful trend. Uh, I like these two up to the north. I think they're far more reliable. But in any event, now let's talk about the CFS forecast. Now, here on this image, we I want to show you this was the CAF forecast um, for um, back in the middle of September, right? And I blew it up so you could see it a little bit more here. So um, this is the forecast uh, for going into actually, um, this was late September into October 8th. And the green dot is uh, where we are in January, according to the dash black line. That's the ensemble mean of all these different red and blue lines. This the dash black line is the ensemble average. OK, and you can see in January we are uh, warmer than 0 0.5. So we're almost close to neutral. That tells us that the La Nina is going to end in December. Now you compare that to what it was showing back in September and back in September, the La Nina, as you can see, the green dot here was still going on as of January. So this was back in September. So this is the old data here, still La Nina in January. 
and then weakening in the second half of winter. But the new data has it weakening even faster. And then the, yeah, this is the update. Now this is the brand new data which just came out earlier on the Thursday. And you can see the green dot here, it's even weaker. And the dashed black line is now at neutral by January. So this is a very sharp rise here. This indicates that the La Nina is gonna collapse in December. That's what this is saying. And then for most of winter, we're at neutral conditions. All right, the MJO, this is a mid, all the way out to the middle of November. You can see here, this is um, the projections from the European, which is, I think, the most reliable model. But uh, this takes us to mid-November, as you can see. So the red dots here, this is the next five days. And then we go into phase three, the blue dots, purple dots, which is phase five. Orange, a day, day 10 in phase four. And then phase five, we get into the blue dots here, day 15. And then maybe, maybe we get into phase six at some point in mid-February. Now the ensemble average is to move it back into the neutral circle, but definitely phase three, uh, phase two, phase three, phase four, and phase five into early November. Here's the GFS ensemble, which is showing the same sort of thing, like blow it up, you can see it a little more. Again, it comes out and by November, it's into phase six. And the CFS is showing the same kind of thing. Notice again how it swings out, right? And in phase three, and at the end of October, phase four, and then goes into phase five and six in November. Well, what does that mean? Well, in November, phase five is a big trough on the East Coast and a strong ridge on the West Coast. So this, that's a pretty cold, cold looking map from phase five. Now, if we go into phase six in November, the trough is much weaker. So uh, it becomes much less amplified. But that's what it does show. So the overall pattern definitely is going to keep the trough, according to the MJO, over the eastern United States for the next two or three weeks. Okay. Now let's take a look at the snow cover. This is from the Rutgers Snow Lab. And you can see the snow cover looks quite extensive as of October 16th. Very extensive in Siberia, as you can see. Not so much in northern Canada. And you look at the anomalies, you can see that it's way above normal in southern Russia, Mongolia, northeast China. But in Canada it's actually below normal. And that's because we've had a fairly warm uh, September into early October in Western Canada. So that's one of the reasons why it has, it's not, and you can see the discrepancy here. This is the snow cover by region. So if you look at um, for, this is Eurasia, and the red line here, we're actually at the top of the scale compared to all the last 20 years. Okay, of course, that's in mid-October. Now this is, um, North, this is North America. Here the red line, look, it's way below. It's at the bottom. So North America snow is at record low levels. And in mid-October, the South, the Eurasian Siberian snow falls almost, it's in the top 10 or maybe in the snowiest at this point in a long, long time. Uh, so very, very different conditions. And if you look at the graph, the anomalies will see even more. This is Siberia here to the top, okay? And you can see the red line is the current 2025. And we're way up here, right? We're way up here has exploded. Now the green line right here, that's 2425. So let me blow this up a little bit. You can see it a little more. So the green line here, this is last year. You see the green line was way below normal all the way to November, only briefly catching up for a couple of days in October. Here in October though, once we start October, the red line, which is the current has been way above normal. Now that is Siberia. This is North America. And it's the exact opposite, okay? The green line was last year, the red line is this current year. And you can see in October, it's been way below normal. <clears throat> so, but the key really is the Siberian snow cover, not North American snow cover. That really does become a problem in North America until we get into November. And we can see the difference here. This is the October snow cover as of October 8th. It looks pretty extensive. Of course, there is a gap here. You can see the gap very nicely in central Siberia, but a very extensive snow cover here. And what happens is, just, just to compare, show you how good the GFS has been with this, on the left-hand side, this is the forecast for snowfall from October 8 to 15, all right? That, that's what it's gonna look like. This is the actual snow cover October 15th. That's pretty damn good. There's a little weakness here on the, uh, compared to the uh, the forecast. There's, there's a little too, too much snow here, right here, but the rest of it looks really, really good. That's a pretty good forecast. Now, this is for the next two weeks. This takes us to October 31 on the GFS. That is extensive, heavy snow cover. The, 
the highest it's been in quite a while. Now, earlier, there was some concern that a warming ridge was going to move in from central Russia and shut off the snow cover in the last week of October, but that's no longer the case. So we'll see how that plays out. Okay, now let's shift over to the tropics. There's our very strong tropical disturbance, which I'm very concerned about. I've talked about this for a while. Several days ago, this is coming off the Africa at a very far southern latitude. And here it is. If you look at the latitude, it is still below at around 9, 8, 10 degrees latitude. And that's much further south than many other tropical waves. When these tropical waves come off over the Cape Verde Islands and too far north, they often get curved out to sea. But this one is coming in so far south, if it continues on this course, it's actually going to hit Trinidad or the north coast of uh, South America. Now, it's probably going to gain some latitude. And once it gets into the central and western Caribbean, it's going, to, it's going to rapidly intensify. So this is something to watch out for. Now, depending on the upper air pattern, that could either pull it north or turn it into Central America or turn it out to the northwest. We don't know yet. But the models are clearly very bullish on this. This is, oops, this is the a European model here for midday and Thursday. You can see the projections, which takes us for the next four and a half days to October 21 moving into the Southeast Caribbean. And then if we look at the ensemble mean, we can see that the uh, EPS is, has a strong cluster of activity here in the south, south, southwest part of the Caribbean. See how far south this is? Off the coast of Nicaragua. Now the GFS has the same sort of concept, but it's much further north. And because it's further north, the trough is able to catch it and kick it out to sea. So the European implies Gulf of Mexico threat potentially, maybe a turn towards Florida. Down the road, the GFS, it already looks like it's gone because it's further north. So I just want to point that out. I don't have a, uh, I kind of think the European solution is probably correct here, but I'm not certain of that. So let's just see how that plays out over the weekend and early next week. All right, let's get into the operational forecast across North America. This is the upper air map for Friday morning. You can see you have this gargantuan ocean storm right here in the northwest Atlantic, okay? It's trapped by this huge blocking pattern in Greenland. Now, some people suggest that this is more like a North Atlantic thumb ridge. I think it's a negative NEO, I'm gonna call it that. And then you have this other trough trailing from Southern California all the way up to the Dakotas. So notice the flow here. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it a little more. See the flow here, it's coming out of the Northwest. There's your cold high pressure for Friday morning, dropping right down into Virginia, Pennsylvania. Now, eventually, the high is going to drop off the mid-Atlantic coast. This, is going to, this upper low is going to go, and the pattern is going to warm up, and that's exactly what happens. So as we get into Saturday, the temperatures get into the 70s for many places east of the Mississippi River. But then on Sunday, we get these two short waves right here, developing quite nicely. One short wave in the northern stream, the other one in the southern stream. They merge into one big long wave trough and they pass underneath the block here and they get a negatively tilted trough. If this was the middle of winter, this would be a major storm, no doubt about it. And of course, there's more energy coming in. That's the other thing about this pattern. You have this energy coming down from Alaska, but because you have the blocking here, this energy is forced to dive southeast. And you see there's another one coming in behind it. So this is going to generate strong low pressure and bring a major rainstorm on Sunday, Sunday night and Monday to the Ohio Valley, the Mid-Atlantic and New England, depending on your area. Here we go. This is the maps here. This is now the one at the top is a Sunday morning. All right. There's a lot of rain coming up on Saturday night into the Ohio Valley where they really need it. There's the first low in Michigan. There's the cold front. All right. And then here is a Sunday night. There's the second low forms in Ohio. And West Virginia, and then it bombs out over the mid-Atlantic, and you get heavy rain in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, New York City, New England, that sort of stuff. Pretty nice rain event there. Okay. Now, we go out of that, what happens, this is now Monday and Wednesday, and we just continue to see a series of short waves and troughs drop down from the Gulf of Alaska. Normally, these things should be causing a big, big ridge on the eastern United States, but again, because of the blocking here, these systems, one here up at Bering Sea, another one, another one, boom, 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 coming right down underneath the block. And sure enough, there's a second reinforcing front coming in on uh, October 23rd. Not a big deal, but it's there. Uh, it's a, this is a seasonally cool pattern. There's no real warmth here to speak of. Okay. Now things get, as we approach the end of the month, the last week of October, things get a little interesting. 
if you look at this map here, look at this, this is October 25. We have a huge trough in the from, from the Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, all the way down to California. Now, when you have a trough like this, this almost always creates a gargantuan ridge over the eastern United States. But in this case, we're not seeing that because we have the blocking here in Greenland goes pushing up into Baffin Island. At the surface, this is high pressure dropping out of Canada again into the Midwest. There it is. Low pressure passing underneath it, oh, Texas and Oklahoma, some rain in, into the Gulf Coast area. And this high just takes over. And it just sits there for several days. And it looks absolutely uh, fabulous. As we go towards October, this is October 25. This is the European Ensemble on the upper left. And then this is October 27th. Now, this pattern does not look particularly threatening. Okay, we have this big trough right here from Alaska all the way down to Cal Southern California, huge, sending energy into California and Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. Then we have the block over Greenland and Baffin Island and the trough on the East Coast. Okay, this trough weakens and the one on the Pacific starts to send big energy in. You see how it's coming in now? Before, well, off, here it's off the West Coast. Now it's moving into the West Coast of the Rockies. But because of the blocking pattern, this energy is going to be forced to go underneath it. That's what the blocking does. It takes this energy and forces it underneath it. This is really cool. Here's the surface map. This is October 27th. Big high over Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Dry and clear all the way to Chicago, the Mississippi River. But here's our storm coming out of the Rockies. Okay. Possible major East Coast storm, October 31. This is the European Ensemble, October 29th. The energy that was coming in from the Pacific is forced, it breaks apart, and the piece goes underneath the block. It can't go into the block. It's got to go underneath it. Sure enough, here it is. All right? It's huge blocking in Greenland. This is now a strongly negative NAO, non-Atlantic thumb ridge. And you have this trough over the Mississippi Valley that's neutrally tilted. This is a really nice, I don't know if this, what, if this means anything for the winter, but this is a really nice pattern. Okay. This is now the European uh, Ensemble for October 31, and there's the GFS Ensemble for October 31. You see this southern shortwave? Look at this. Very nice. Huge block to the north. See how it's forced underneath it, forced underneath it, forced underneath it? Same thing. There's some kind of low pressure here in the mid-Atlantic. This, this looks pretty damn strong in the southern jet stream. I'm impressed. And of course, this black circle here represents the positive anomaly. See the, see the red? The anomaly. Negative NAO. Now, what happens, this is the European AI ensemble showing the same thing. See the trough? It's negatively tilted. Running northwest to southeast. See it going like this? There's the block. So it's going to go underneath the block towards the mid-Atlantic. It can't go up to Chicago. The surface low can't go to Michigan. It's got to go underneath it. And this is the AI ensemble taking it right off the mid-Atlantic coast underneath the block on October 31. Whew. Nice looking storm. It means, I don't know how, how bad this is going to be. I don't know if it's a big low, but if something's coming October 31. Pretty significant system from what I can see. Here's the European um, Extended, uh, also for October 31. Same thing, very strong short wave here in the mid-Atlantic moving underneath the block. And there's the CFS Extended as well. And you can see, look at that. Big short wave in the southern jet stream, strong blocking to the north. I'm telling you, if this was the middle of winter, I'd be going crazy. A lot of snow mongers would be doing so as well. I don't know if this means that the pattern is going to last into the winter. But again, there's that, you know, old theory that the old timers use that October upper air patterns are indicative of what it means for the winter. I've seen that Sometimes turn out to be true. I've seen that sometimes turn out to be bullshit. We'll just have to wait and see. But, you know, so far, I'm kind of bullish about the winter. But we'll get more to that next time. All right. This is meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I will see you over on the Weather Risk Grains Twitter page and over on the website.